Did you just throw your phone? <laughs> no, I did not throw the phone. Oh, you guys didn't see that? Yeah, you didn't see that. 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 Yeah, you didn't uh, so we have an awesome show lined up for you guys today. Hall of History today, we are going to do DC versus Marvel. Um, comics and in the cinema as well, too. Um, we're going to cover a broad history of both organizations, the impact that they've made here in the country and abroad, um, and how they impacted us uh, directly uh, as people. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, it's going to be an awesome show. Um, and again, appreciate. I, I try to say it as much as possible. Uh, we appreciate so much you guys tuning in, subscribing, and downloading our podcast every single week. Uh, without you, um, I would uh, just be in my PJs uh, watching TV. But now I'm also in my PJs uh, from the shirt <laughs> down uh, <laughs> at my desk instead. So uh, I definitely appreciate that. Yeah, and uh, you know, it's it's fun to be able to do this and you know share our opinions and it seemed like, you know, other people care about it than just us. So thank you for making us right. feel like we're at least a little important at times. Uh, but before we dive into the history of the comics themselves, we wanted to take a moment to, of course, recognize the tragic and heartbreaking loss of Chadwick Boseman, who was only 43. Um, that's far too early for anyone. And for me personally, and again, from, you know, the comic standpoint of it, Chadwick Boseman really threw the doors open um, and took this character and made it his own, basically. Um, he will forever be synonymous with T'Challa, I think. Um, much like Mark Hamill is for, you know, Luke Skywalker and things like that. Chadwick Boseman will always be T'Challa. There really won't be another. And, you know, Chadwick Boseman did such a great job. But also, while he was going through, you know, all of the, the surgeries and his chemo, he still took it upon himself to make this movie because he realized how important the movie was. And I think that in and of itself was it transcended more than just the genre or even movies that transcended an entire community, you know, and, and it was such a monumental moment that I think we will forever look back and realize Chadwick Boseman moved us all forward as a society with his devotion to this character. And I, I can't, you know, express enough how heartbreaking it is for him or for us, I should say. Yeah. Um, you know, I, and I think for me, um, being, um, being an artist, um, myself and, mm -hmm. you know, growing up, so growing up, you, um, whether it's in, in cartoons, um, on TV, um, hell, sometimes even in church, um, no matter where I was at, uh, the uh, the misrepresentations oftentimes and pictures and images of, of of hope of safety of security of power of romance of knowledge of success it didn't look like me and you spend your whole life not having that and I think uh, similar to what you said I mean this transcended you know, it, 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 it was more than just another Marvel blockbuster, billion dollar break, record breaking movie. Mm -hmm. I mean, it showed, um, it showed that somebody that looks like me or somebody that looks like so many people can do, can, can be successful, can, can, can be kind, can be noble, can be brave. And I'm at a loss. I'm at a loss, honestly, and yeah. I think that, um, I mean, not even to focus on other movies because that's not the topic of this show, uh, but, you know, for this also to happen, you know, on Jackie Robinson Day, um, he played Jackie Robinson, and on, on, on Jackie Robinson Day in the MLB, he passes, um, and, and this country, this country is going through um, a, a what I hope ends up being a seismic shift in the way that people who look like me, people that look like my friends, people that look like my brothers, my sisters, um, are, are treated differently. And I, and I 
uh, I'm grateful um, to uh, Mr. Bozeman for for e- e- being a being a, um, a motion forward um, for us uh, in a positive way uh, to be uncompromising in his morals, uncompromising in who he was as a person, um, and more importantly, who he was as a black person, um, and, and to really move. Uh, this country forward. Uh, so I, I think it's, you know, I don't know. 2020 sucks. It sucks. It does. Yeah. And um, it, it's, a, it's a tremendous loss uh, for so many people. Most importantly, his family. Um, you know, I, I, I just, um, I have uh, limitless uh, respect and admiration uh, for somebody who, who dedicated and gave so much um, to so many people. Yeah. So uh, before we dive in, we're just going to take a brief moment of silence to remember Chadwick Boseman. Um, so if you wouldn't mind joining us, uh, we'd really appreciate it. All right. So Anthony, how familiar are you with comics history? <laughs> I feel like you know the answer to that question. Um, not well, you might very. shock me. <laughs> no, I'm not going to shock you. Uh, not very. So I, I was never really into comic books. Um, That's fair. Yeah, they A were not accessible. Weren't. They weren't accessible to me either. That's also fair. Yeah, I could not. I would have to travel over an hour to even purchase one. I didn't grow up with the internet. Jeez. Yeah, there was no... You sound like you grew up in a town in Footloose, though, where, like, they burn the books, like... <laughs> we know, we didn't have a book... We didn't have a bookstore. We never had a library. We don't have any... Oh, my God. You've seen where I lived. Like, I grew up in a town of, like, 196 people. We had one stoplight, a gas station, and a dairy aisle. A dairy aisle is an ice cream parlor, for those of you that don't know, but that's literally I thought you it. meant literally a dairy aisle. No, like people, I mean, they got a Dollar General in like 2011 and you would have thought, you would have thought they hit the big times. I'm serious. So there was just, it was just not accessible. It just wasn't my world. It just wasn't accessible to me. That's, that's understandable. Well, comics themselves, I think were originally supposed to be treated as like this disposable, like highly accessible thing to people, but it was just disposable fun kid stuff. I mean, they started all the way in 1938. And that was originally DC had started. It was known as Detective Comics first. That's where the DC comes from, boys and girls. Um, And Detective Comics had, you know, just been like these little genre stories here and there until um, Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster. I always pronounce his name wrong. I want to say it's Joe Schuster. Is it Schuster? Um, (laughs) I always get Schuster's name wrong. Uh, They created Superman. And Superman came out in 1938, Action Comics number one. Wow, that's a lot. Oh, my God. That's a long time yeah. ago. Yeah. In Cleveland. Yeah, they're from Cleveland. Woo! So if you ever go to the Cleveland airport, I don't know if it's still there, but it's in the baggage there. claim, there's a huge Superman uh, exhibit, I guess you can call it, because it is pretty yeah. big. It was there last year. I don't know. I haven't been there since okay. last year, so <laughs> it was still there then. <laughs> Fingers crossed it's still there. <laughs> All right. Uh, but in that time, they kind of had a boom of characters, because not too many years later, Batman, who debuted in Detective Comics, and Batman... More famously, everyone knows Bill Kane, or Bob Kane, excuse me, drew Batman. However, there is a great documentary on Hulu called um, Batman and Bill, I believe. And it explains to you how Bill Finger... Yeah, that's on Hulu. It it is on Hulu. Uh, Bill Finger is the one who did everything you know and love about Batman. And Bob Kane took it, made it his own, made a backdoor deal with DC to bury Bill Finger... And Bill Finger later on went on to write like one Adam West episode of the Batman and died in his apartment alone with overdue notices because he didn't really have money because Bob Kane screwed him out of it all. Wow. So anyone who loves Bob Kane, I'm sorry to burst your bubble, but the man was a monster. Batman is amazing because of Bill Finger. He's the one who did the Batcave. He's the one who helped come up with like the villains, all of that. So Bill Finger, you are a hero in my book. Um, But also around that same time, Wonder Woman came out. So you already have the big three before 1950, and DC was just steamrolling at that time. Um, 
And, you know, people are probably wondering, when did the Justice League and things like that come? That didn't come till later. But around 1940, 1941, they did do a Justice Society. And that was with characters they had already established. So was this in was... response? So sorry to interrupt you. Was this there Wonder you know. Woman, uh, like especially Wonder Woman and then this Justice Society, was this in response to the sentiment in the world at the time, like World War II? Or did this have nothing to do with it? I, it just seems very convenient timing to me. It seems like it would sure. be together. So I know, I've heard stories that Superman uh-huh. was created because either Jerry Siegel or Joe Schuster, one of the two, their dad was like mugged and they wanted, they were hoping like, where was this person to save him? Like if this person existed, that's why he came about. Um, the Justice Society, I want to say it was in response to the events that were going on because that was the first time anybody's really pulled all these characters together. Right. Um, but Wonder Woman was actually created by a Harvard um, psychologist, William Moulton, Moulton Marston. Um, he created Wonder Woman. And Wonder Woman had a weird history because although she was a female powered like superhero and she was like really strong and everything, he made her weakness originally like she would lose her powers if she was put in chains by a man. Like if she was like bound by yeah. It was a really weird like history with the, Wonder Woman. It was the forties, so, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. Was the, he, even the, the he tone had, of the position. Yeah. Even he had a weird history uh, or weird relationship, I should say. Him and his wife ended up bringing in, like, one of his students or his student aides into their marriage, too. So he had, like, two wives. Uh So he himself had a weird dynamic. um, And that kind of plays into Wonder Woman's earlier stories. So if you ever have a chance to reread some of Wonder Woman's earlier stories, you're like, this is weird. That's why. Um, (laughs) But later on, you would see timely comics come about which timely comics was uh 1939 i believe and timely comics is what would come on to become known as marvel comics and this is with the response to world war ii because in this was when um jack kirby created um captain america with joe simon and that was the iconic cover that everyone knows where cap's punching out hitler on -hmm. the cover um and that became a huge thing for people but the common misconception is that Stan Lee created Captain America, and he didn't. He was involved. He wrote some of the stories. But at that time, Stan Lee was like a sandwich boy. <clears throat> he was an errand boy for Jack Kirby and Joe Simon. So it's ironic that the sandwich boy ended up becoming top dog <laughs> later on down the road. So if you're looking for a job, folks, sandwich say, boy. I, I, say, I wish it was still like that. You, know, you, oh, can't, get, you can't get You can't get on to... Uh, into jobs like that now deliver no. papers or whatever <laughs> like whatever he was doing over there no you could do that with a college degree and you still probably might not get the job <laughs> <laughs> right just sixty thousand dollars in debt yeah and a lot of shame and heartbreak <laughs> yeah speaking from experience here folks at times <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> uh but comics were usually looked at at that early time as like a cheap source of entertainment during world right. war ii because they were only like I think five cents and two cents, like they were sh- really short, but they would sell millions of copies. So the print run was ginormous compared to nowadays. But the reason why they're so valuable is because who held on to something from 1941 in such pristine Correct. condition? Like right. <laughs> that's people they don't have stuff. From, back then, they weren't thinking back then. Like, oh my god, this piece of paper is going to be worth you know thousands of dollars. God no, no one yeah. thought about that. Um, but as the war ended, thankfully, um, the sales started to decline for superhero titles. And I don't know if it's attributed to people were like, well, the war is over. The world's safe. We don't need these heroes. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> but they started doing more genres like horror novels or horror comics and romance comics and science fiction. And that's when the Western craze kind of kicked up. Um, so there was a lot of comics like that. And... It wasn't really until later in the mid-50s that you got into the Silver Age of comics. That's what I call the prime time of comics. That's that's where most people know the history of comics started was then. Um, and that's when you had Stan Lee going over and Marvel kind of becoming its own thing. Um, it went from Timely Comics to Atlas Comics to Marvel Comics. Um, 
And that's when also in 1956, DC kind of revamped some of their older characters like Green Lantern and The Flash, and they brought them back with new backstories and new this and all that. And they kind of started taking off again, too. Um, but so Marvel it's like a Comics, rebirth after the war. Yes. And which they're like, okay, this, these aren't selling. We need to come up with a way to drive uh, people's desire to, to, to read these, to, yeah. to engage with them. Which is really poetic when you think about it. Yeah. Like, after the war, you kind of rebirthed all of right. this. and Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Time to make Nazi, the money again. some Nazis were ready to... <laughs> yeah. Put it to bed, guys. <laughs> Let's start a new one. So. But, uh, you know, uh, Marvel Comics, when they came on the scene, <clears throat> they came on the scene because Stan Lee had been writing other stories. Mm-hmm. And... Stan Lee's wife, um, she had told him, you know, look, if you really want to quit, then at least do one book the way you want to do it. Worst case scenario, they hate it. It doesn't matter. You're going to quit anyway. So he did that. And what he did was he ended up creating the Fantastic Four, which is known as Marvel's first family. And that book changed all of comics history because, you know, DC heroes are kind of looked at as similar to the Olympic gods. Like, they really don't have many weaknesses. You right. can't relate to them. They didn't have real problems or anything. And Stan Lee came along and made these heroes who they didn't want to be heroes. Like, Thing was truly disgusted by himself and horrified at what he had become. And, you know, Invisible Woman was afraid of her powers. And they had real struggles. Like, later on, you'd have to worry about paying rent for the Baxter building. <laughs> like, it was real well, issues. We talked, and, we, and we talked about this in, in another episode that we did. And that was creating, like, this human connection with people and saying, like, I do I feel relatable to Batman? And I can mm-hmm. because of Christopher Nolan. Because of the way that story is told, I can feel relatable to Batman. I, can't, I, I, don't, I didn't feel that way with Superman. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you, I guess you could say, I mean, it starts as far back as that. Where yeah. Where we saw the change. And I think, you know, that was something that Stan kind of tapped into, is that people need a hero they can relate to. Yeah. I mean, you even look at Spider-Man, and he was a normal high school kid who, he got these powers, but he still had to worry about his first date. He still had to worry right. about, <laughs> you know, like, finishing his, his homework. Like, right. <laughs> Which is odd. You know. (laughs) Yeah. It's odd that this guy can catch a bus and he's like, I don't know how to talk to that girl. Right. Um, Yeah. But just to give you guys, uh, you know, a brief rundown of the 60s. So in 1962, Spider-Man, Thor, and the Hulk all debuted. In 1963, Iron Man, X-Men, and the Avengers all debuted. And then in 1964, Captain America was revived. And that's not even including that the Fantastic Four would later on bring in Black Panther, they would bring in the Inhumans, um, mm-hmm. Thor would bring in Loki, and all of these characters would bring in people with them. I could do this all day. So you had this huge boom in the 60s, and when I tell you that DC was getting steamrolled, it wasn't even a contest. Because DC heroes all had a storyline of bad guy, bad guy gets beat up, justice but marvel woman had, on the arm <laughs> yeah exactly like yeah. but marvel had you know a tragic story like yeah yeah there was just to serve but everyone still hates spider-man and they don't know he's just a kid like there was always a story arc to it um and then you know you kind of get it more and more into these deeper stories as time progressed, and they c- c- created the Comic Code Authority. Much like the video games episode we guys were talking about, everything people want to attribute back to, that's why my kid's a bad kid. <laughs> right. Yeah. Instead, of, instead of looking in the mirror sometimes, people want to blame <laughs> the old comic book or the video game. Yeah. Uh, so the Comic Code Authority kind of created those guidelines for the Silver Age comics. Um, and when the 70s came around, that's when the Bronze Age of comics kicked in. And you maybe might get more familiar with this because in the 70s is kind of when um, Lou Ferrigno was on TV as the Incredible Hulk. Um, in 1972, the Mego Toys. I don't know if you ever had me- Mego Toy yeah. or had one or heard of one. It was like little, it was like G.I. Joe dolls. They were kind of like that big. 
and they had like the clothes and everything and they had all these licenses for like planet of the apes and um what else do they have star trek um and then they i was this. like if it's just planet of the apes I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I couldn't remember Star Trek. <laughs> like, Wait, what else? Maybe it's just playing of the apes, but I mean... <laughs> so all these apes were dressed like here. No. <laughs> right. Uh, but yeah, they had Planet of the Apes, they had Star Trek, they had superhero lines, and those became super popular toys. And they're still super valuable. That's why I said if you have any... <laughs> but Send you don't. Send to you, so. or what does that mean? We go 50-50 on it. You just told me they were valuable. You should have opened with Send Them to Me, and then told me after you sold it how much money you made. Well, this would have been like an antique roadshow type thing. I would have been the appraiser and been like, listen, a cut is mine. Can you appraise this virtually? I mean, Are you I, that good? You wouldn't know <laughs> if I was like, it looks like it's in mint condition, uh, my friend. Everyone, like, all right, everyone send them pictures of what you got. Send them to our email. <laughs> of your Migos. In, in a, in, <laughs> Don't. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Not, <laughs> not just any pictures, please, God. Uh, uh, but send us a DM. But, yeah, if you... I'm taking a cut, though. If I tell you you have a gem on your hand, yeah. I'm getting a cut. Yeah. Uh, but what else happened in the 70s? Oh, Superman, with Christopher Reeves, debuted on the big screen in 1978. And everyone knows Superman was a huge hit. Yeah, it was. Um, it was big for the creative Superman, too, because they finally got to see their names like up there. So that was cool. Um, but during that time, you had comics grow darker. And I think this is where the movies kind of pull from now is you had Spider-Man was involved in the death of his girlfriend, Gwen Stacy, in a horrific way. So spoiler alert, if you guys haven't read the comic, Gwen Stacy like falls off a bridge because of Green Goblin and Spider-Man goes to catch her and he shoots his web. And when he catches her with the web, the force from falling snaps her neck and they show it in the panel like her neck just like snaps back. She and that's like what kills her. bounces because of the... Like, yeah, you see her back, like, snap because of the force of the web. So He should have just, just let her hit the water. <laughs> like, was there water point... down there, or was it... <laughs> yeah, it was off a bridge. Oh. So, I mean, at what point do you really... Yeah. Like, Spider-Man, maybe you did more harm. Who and knows? again, <laughs> and again I, I feel like it, it, it's a tone and a sentiment for the time period. I mean, look at New York City, circa 1970. Mm-hmm. Real rough. Yeah, you had a lot of gangsters and mobsters and all that. Yeah. And, I mean, Chicago, nineteen seventy. All these, all these major U.S. cities in the nineteen seventies, crime was terrible, terrible, mm -hmm. terrible. And they even had, you know, around that time, because horror films were getting bigger and bigger, um, they had characters debut like Doctor Strange and Alan Moore did Swamp Thing. Ghost Rider came in, um, Blade, which everyone knows because of Wesley Snipes. <laughs> Uh, uh, but Blade came in, and the comic code was kind of like, whoa, you guys are flirting with danger here. And they actually banned, well, not banned, but they said, like, you can't put this comic out without the seal. Because Stan Lee had made a comic where drugs were becoming a rampant thing in the 70s. Yeah. And Stan Lee had made a comic where this kid took a bad trip on, I think, acid or something like that, and he thought he could fly. And Spider-Man had to, like, try to save him as he was, like, falling off a roof and stuff. And it really dove into, like, the consequences of drugs. And Stanley put it out without the Comic Code Authority okaying it, which was a huge, ah. But because of that, we got a Green Lantern and a Green Arrow comic where it's a super famous cover. It shows, uh, it was, at the time, it was like, ah. It shows <laughs> <laughs> Green Arrow's uh, sidekick, Speedy with his arm wrapped around, and he's about to shoot up heroin. Oh and my Green Arrow God. walks in. This is on the cover. <laughs> so, you know, you go from Superman like this to shooting up heroin on, on a cover. Like, that's a stark jump in a matter of, like, 15 years. Can we have that? Can we put it up on the screen for, for the folks <laughs> yeah. to see in the video? Right yeah. here, folks. Um, but, you know, that's kind of the, the style of comics they were taking. Green Arrow and Green Lantern also went on it's actually if you know if you are interested there's a whole um omnibus of it where you can find all the comics in one book it's an interesting read where they travel the country and they see you know these injustices that we fight here what's it like out there and they see like segregation and they see all these real injustices that go on and they kind of contemplate what's their role in all of this like if they're saving all these lives they're still not saving these people who are affected mm -hmm. every day by these things and it was a really powerful storyline um 
But then, you know, in the 70s, you also got into Alan Moore creating Watchmen, which they just had the series about. They made a movie about and Watchmen kind of came out and they're on that time. And then you had later on late 70s, early 80s, Frank Miller would go on and do like The Dark Knight, which is what Batman vs Superman was based off of. He would go on and do um, Daredevil and change Daredevil's character up. He kind of made it a darker tones. Um, and that's kind of, you know, when people start taking comics more seriously, because now it was serious literature being written with like darker stakes and hero. Not just for hero. kids. Yeah, not just for kids. Um, but during that time, the DC and Marvel war was so intense because uh, artists were like freelance. So you're basically work for hire. You didn't own any of the characters or anything. So a lot of the art looks similar between the two books because it's the same artist. So what I, I had read, there's a book called Slugfest, if anyone's interested. Um, but what I read was that they would often like cherry pick the artist from either company because at one point in time, they were in the same building. Like, oh, my God. So there was a lot of like... I go over there today. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Sorry about that. Like there was a lot of people who claimed... Um, espionage type things where like they stole my script they stole right, my right, drawings right. um doom patrol came out everywhere in the months. country and they had to be in the same building my god exactly <laughs> right you could have literally went anywhere <laughs> well i think it was that the same company that produced dc comics like actually put it out the not the publisher but whoever actually like helped them get on the, the racks owned both like they did both so they were there for time purposes, I guess. Wow. Um, <laughs> but like Doom Patrol, which is a big show now, came out, I want to say, eight months before X-Men came out. And people were like, ah, I think Stan Lee stole that idea because in Doom Patrol, they're led by a man, a bald man in a wheelchair. <laughs> and Strangely reminiscent. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, but that story got debunked because they said there's no way. It wasn't enough time. For like eight months sounds like a long time, but back then to like take the comment and out, come up with all the yeah, they yeah. Keep so they were just like yeah. coincidence, but that's why a lot of characters in Marvel and DC look similar is because a mm -hmm. lot of the artists and the writers kind of bounce back and forth. So unknowing to yourself, you might think like oh, I have this million dollar idea, not realizing that it's your idea because you heard it a week ago <laughs> in a pitch meeting. Right. <laughs> like, that would be like if you and I went on another podcast and like. This sounds amazing. Today we're gonna cover this, guys. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, I think we should do that. <laughs> exactly. Which we don't do at all. We we come up with these topics all on our own. Fresh. We have the pulse of America right here. Right, right here. I'm about folks. to say. I'm about to say. Clearly, you guys know that we come up with them on our own because they're obscure as hell. So, <laughs> I think, clearly, you know, there's no science behind this. Exactly. But then uh, in 85, now we're getting closer to our time. So you might, you might okay, be there with me. I mean, I'm not here on this earth yet. Don't anyone get any <laughs> ideas, but I'm here. You're getting there. I'm, get, uh, I'm getting there. 85, they came out with Crisis on Infinite Earths, which a lot of people are familiar with. Um, DC had the multiverse. Mm -hmm. So DC had, you know, there's an Earth X and an Earth 16 and all these different flashes and all these different Earths. And what they did was they made this giant event to put all their universes into one. So there would be one Flash, not 52 other Flashes. Right. And it was crazy at the time because they were killing off heroes that you didn't expect. And they stayed dead. Like, it, they didn't come back. So there's a, a iconic cover where Superman's holding Supergirl and he's crying. And Supergirl died in that comic. Um, the Flash died in that comic to save like the multiverse he ran on his treadmill and he's running on his treadmill as fast as he can to like kind of merge them oops, to merge them and as he's running like you see his body deteriorating and like his costumes on like a skeleton and then the costume like vanishes and then he's gone because he ran so fast to put them all together that he kind of put himself out of existence so for a comic that's pretty brutal um right but <laughs> that was the kind of stuff that they did in it and i think it's been a long time since i read it so somebody please correct me but i think barry allen becomes the lightning bolt that goes and hits himself 
in the past to become the Flash. I think that's how it ended. So it's like a circular wow. thing where he becomes... So he had to die, no matter what, basically. <laughs> um, but then, like, in the 80s, they also killed Robin from Batman and Robin horrifically. Where... I think it was, I think it was late 80s. Joker kills him with a crowbar. Like, he beats him like to beats death. Like, beats him to death. Wow. <laughs> yes. Well, he's still alive. And, and then they blow up the building. So, <laughs> did the crowbar kill him or did the bomb kill him? <laughs> but, you know, you have all those. And then you know, in the 90s, um, I think it was 92, 91, they kill Superman, which was unheard of. Yeah, um, he can't die. But they killed him. Yeah, and then he came back to life with some BS. Like, his heart rate just slowed so much that everyone thought he died. And he wore, like, this all-black suit. It was a, a solar suit. And it kind of, like, absorbed the sun rays because that's where he gets his strength. So he came back to life with that. And he had, like, a long, like, mullet-type haircut. Like, <laughs> a mane, like a horse, yeah. like a steed. <laughs> like he was in an Old Spice commercial, right. just kind of flowing in the wind. Right. Uh, but one character they haven't killed that I've known of is they haven't even attempted to kill Batman. So I'd be interested to see that storyline where, like, they're like, Batman's dead, folks. They've killed Captain America. But Robert Pattinson's They've like, killed. no, I think he should live for. Well, I think he should live for a while. <laughs> He's like, if I may, yeah, uh, just at one movie. <laughs> yeah, I like to say employed. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the '90s also gave us X Men, which is yeah. from that shirt that you're wearing right there. Yeah. The um, we got the animated series of X Men. The '90s was also kind of the downfall of comics because Image Comics came out. And, like, Dark Horse comics, like, more third-party yeah. things came out. But when Image Comics came out, they took... It was from Todd McFarlane and Jim Lee and Rob Liefeld, who kind of did um, New Mutants. He did Deadpool or Rob Liefeld. Um, Jim Lee did the X-Men runs. Um, and... I just said his name. Oh, Todd McFarlane did Venom, which everyone loves Venom. And they created their own comic book company because they felt like hey we're doing a lot of the work we're not even getting to keep like this is, these aren't our property right so let's go do our own thing and when they did that what they ended up doing was comic collectors love collecting comics clearly but you only have one cover one iconic cover what they did was they made like 17 covers for the same story so you don't know which one's the real number one anymore is it the number one that came out here is it the holographic number one right. is it the one that's like that you didn't know why would they do that and because they wanted to give you edgy and like get as much as they could not the way to but be they edgy. <laughs> they hurt the whole thing because it was yeah. really like it was so weird it was like holographic there was this weird material that like it shined like when you moved it but it wasn't holographic. it was all bad 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 and it took a real dip but luckily that's when the movies kicked in and you had Blade, and you had X Men. So now we're getting to you know I'm the here. cinema. I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now now we're here. Um, I'm here. Financial decisions on both parts though made Warner Brothers actually purchase DC Comics, and it's expensive Disney, to make movies too. I mean. Yes, and Disney went on to purchase Marvel Comics. Um, so now we're talking cinematic. So cinematically. Where, what's the first comic movie you remember watching? Blade. Really? Yeah. Wow, I didn't think you would watch Blade. No, I was a kid. We were young. Yeah, we were, but I, that's why I didn't watch it. It was vampires. I didn't want anything to do with it. Yeah. I watched It the Clown whenever I was like seven years old. That explains like, a whole lot right now, like, folks. Yeah. I was like, Tim Curry's my hero. And then I, I, I mean... <laughs> From then on out, I, anything that would make me almost piss myself, I was, <laughs> I was down for for some reason. Um, but yeah, I'm the exact opposite. I yeah, Blade. Um, okay. Watching my friend Brandon's house. See, and we talked about this in another show where I was like, mm, must not have been that. Uh, it might have been the Batman show that we did where I was like, must have not been that Batman. memorable. Clearly, Blade yeah. was because I remember, where, or it was so. It was so jarring to my child psyche <laughs> that it forever left an imprint uh, in my mind. But it was Blade, yeah. 
you thought Blade and Wesley Snipes were one and the same. Like, this man's a vampire. Like, I can't. <laughs> I didn't know who Wesley Snipes was. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't watch Too Wong Fu or anything like that, so I didn't. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't know uh, who he was at the time. Fair enough. Yeah. I think I, not Batman films withstanding the first like real comic book film that I consider like good mm-hmm. was X Men that I watched. That was, and er- at, was that early two thousand. Two thousand. Okay. And that changed See, I'm my here life. now. I'm here now. <laughs> yeah. Now, names and dates, you're on it now. Yeah, this is now your wheelhouse. Yeah. <laughs> this is my wheelhouse. Uh, that changed my life, though, because I saw Hugh Jackman as Wolverine, and the rest, folks, I don't know if there's a bigger Hugh Jackman fan than this guy. You and I are going to be good friends. So much so, I went to his one-man show, and I felt like my soul was regenerated. I'm, I'm not say, afraid to say I cried three times in that show. It's almost an unhealthy, <laughs> almost an unhealthy level. Yeah. Almost, almost. Right. Um, but then you kind of get into you know the X Men films and Spider Man with Tobey yeah. Maguire, where mm-hmm. they try to pass off a 35 year old as a high school. He was not 35 <laughs> at the time, but yes, he I get was, what you're saying. He was like late 20s, early 30s. He was he he was an older gentleman. He did, he yes. Didn't. And I blame them for all the even if you were, misconceptions. Even if, you were, even if he was 35 or however old he was, like you could have had somebody who was 35 that visually looked like they could pass yeah. as a team, but you didn't do that either. So. No. And like I blame him. Well, I blame that, that whole movie <laughs> for the misconception <laughs> that we had as kids growing up because I was like, oh, I'm a little like that in high school. Like, he had man muscles. No, that's every, no, <laughs> like, that's every high school movie. Haven't you seen those high school movies? I mean, like, The Breakfast Club, all those people. I mean, hell, I was like, <laughs> I was but like, they this guy like looks Jack. like he's 30, he's like 30 <laughs> years old. Like, these are the oldest, Molly- looking, high, <laughs> these are the oldest looking high school kid. I, I I thought I, I thought my gems hadn't dropped whenever I was like 16, 17 years old because I was like I don't look like that. Oh like God. I look nothing like that. Right. Yeah. And the so, girls don't look like Molly Ringwald. She looks like she's like twenty six. <laughs> right. But yeah, yeah, I just if you, you would have gave me that in high school, maybe things would have turned out differently. You know what I'm saying? But they didn't. <laughs> so that's what happened. Uh, but you know, I think that. That was really the where they started trying to suspend the disbelief a little less. Yeah. Because they try to make it look like you know they were high schools. He was only in high school, I think, one year. I think he graduated the next year. So. But and Maybe. again, it was like trying to connect, <laughs> connect, <laughs> create that connection um, with the audience and with people uh, mm-hmm. on a, a human level. Because I mean, not I'm not going to say this because I don't know for sure. But notwithstanding. Uh, the art of cinema in the the arena of cinema um, w- was, I think, much more competitive at that time than the arena of comic books. You had your oh, yeah. giants in comic books, but, I mean, cinema was super competitive. So, I mean, yeah. you had to really grip these people in. Yeah, and by the time Marvel Studios kicked in, everyone was laughing at them, basically. Because they were like, you're going to take these B and C rate characters? Like, no one cares about Iron Man. You lost X-Men. You lost Fantastic Four. You lost Spider-Man. Like, how are you going to make this work? And <laughs> and Robert Downey Jr. just like, hold my beer. <laughs> yeah, he was like, you know what? I cleaned up my life, and I'm ready to rise like a phoenix. But from the ashes of captivity, never has a greater phoenix metaphor been personified in human history. Right. And they didn't want to insure him. Because because of that, because of his history, they were mm-hmm. like, nah, man, you're you're too much of a wild card. And they went ahead and did it with him. And folks, we all wept when he died in that movie. I, did. I don't know if you say you didn't, you're a liar or you're not a real fan or a sociopath. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what no, man. One of the three had a choose. happy life, <laughs> happy life with a child. And then he goes ahead and does that for us. He didn't have to. He didn't have to. But he did it. All right. <laughs> Doctor Strange is like, eh, he had to. That's what <laughs> He's like, that was literally the one chance. <laughs> yeah, that was literally the only thing. I mean, it couldn't really do anything about it. <laughs> but, you know, now that we live in this cinematic um, time where comic book sales are, they're decent, but they're kind of declining a bit. But I think this, if you can get your hands on a cinematic property, though, people are like, that's that's a gold mine. I'm sitting on a gold mine. Right. Um. Little Mrs. Doubtfire for you all. Yeah. <laughs> if you I can do a whole epi- episode dedicated to that movie. 
one thousand percent. We might yeah. actually. I'm about to just say, <laughs> tune in, folks. I think we just yeah. got our next topic. See, this is how they come about. This is exactly how they come about. This is how you know there's no plan for anything. Hundred uh, so percent. Mrs. Doubtfire will be coming up. Just yeah. hang on to your seats, folks. Make sure you watch it first because it's going to be a spoiler-ridden right. episode. Uh, Tell me, we may just flow we, into it right now. I don't know. <laughs> so it opens up with him. <laughs> right. Yeah. So picture this. San Francisco, 1993. This is where we're at. Um, but in Sally Fields, she had no right to be as mad as she was in that movie. Yeah. At least he was a good dad. Uh, yeah. yeah. Like, you know, again, we're, he was a hero is what we're saying. Yeah. He was a superhero there, for his Actually, time. there's going to be an episode about it. There will be. There just is now. Yeah. Now, now it's, it's for sure, folks. Um, but with all the cinema growing and you see how DC, we talked about it with the Batman episode is kind of making strides. Do you think that DC will ever catch up to Marvel or do you think there'll be the friendly competition, but it's always kind of like, you're not going to, I mean, it's competition, but not really. I, I think that there's potential to, I think that there's potential to whenever you have, um, uh, you can't have very many missteps. That's what they need. They need solid, I mean, solid, solid, solid showings. And it needs to be, um, that's why I'm interested to see how this Batman turns out. I'm interested to see how this Batman Mm -hmm. turns out. Uh, And uh, because like, I don't know, uh, the, was it the Emancipation of Harley Quinn? Was that the last one? Yeah, the Birds of Prey. Birds of Prey. Um, Again, not the t- not the hit that they need, not the yeah. hit that they need. They need like Joker level hits. Yeah, that's what they need, and they need a string of those continuously. Um, if they're going to try to hit the king, like if you're going to hit the king, you got to kill the king because he's going to get back up. So yeah. that's that's what they're going to need to do. I'm not going to rule it out. I won't rule it out. I won't. I think I think that they have. I think. What they, I think the sad part is, and, and so many fans, cinema fans and comic book fans alike, I think that you have somebody like DC who has uh, such great IP, and then you see not great films. Yeah. And you're like, what's, what's happening here? You know, yeah. then we see, like, Batman versus Superman, and you're like, mm. yeah. And then Green Lantern. Like you see all these movies that you're like, oh, I don't understand why. I they... wish I didn't. <laughs> right, and and I think I talked about this maybe in the Batman episode. So many things have to go right to to have a really good movie. Only one thing needs to go wrong to completely derail it and ruin it. Yeah, and that's what you see in. I mean, I I love Ryan Reynolds. Love Ryan. Reynolds. Green Lantern probably shouldn't have happened. Yeah. Not with him. Not with him. And I think he's an amazing. I think he's an amazing talent for what he does. Yeah. Deadpool. Look at Deadpool. Yes, that's him. <laughs> Jinx. <laughs> yeah, that's him. That's Ryan Reynolds. Not not Green Lantern. So yeah. I, I I think that um, I, I think that they're starting to to get there. They're really starting to wrap their minds around the storytelling process. Visually, I thought the the Harley Quinn standalone film uh, visually was uh, great. I did. Yeah. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, if they if they could do that level, which I said I did not hate that movie. I thought the movie was good. I liked the movie. Uh, if they can do to that level with a character that people actually want to see in a standalone feature, yeah. I think they'll be in good shape. Let's not let's not let's not think that Harley Quinn was like Superman or Batman. Like people didn't people didn't care that much. I think they mistakenly enough. thought they could, yeah. People didn't care enough about mm-hmm. Harley Quinn to want to see a standalone um, film about her. And that was yeah. the only thing wrong with that film. That was the only thing. I mean, don't I? It, it, it's not like a Ryan Reynolds type scenario at all. Right, because Margot Robbie's perfect for that role. <laughs> yeah, Margot Robbie is like, she's an angel. So anything that she touches, 
doesn't matter. I mean, the the reason why the reason why that movie even did well with a character that no one wanted to watch was because of her. So, at least that's what yeah. I think. Yeah, you can make the argument that without Margot Robbie, it could have been a bigger bloodbath at the box yeah. office than it was. Yeah. Um, but I think you know you hit the nail on the head with you know DC has a potential, and if they crank out you know the darker tones, correct? Because Birds of Prey was kind of dark compared to a Marvel movie, but mm. you know this next Pattinson movie, it's gonna be a really dark Batman. Like it's it's, it's gonna it's be a good test. Teaser. It's gonna be it's gonna be a good test. It's gonna be a good yeah. meter for the public. And I mean, hell, the time in which and we are in this country and this movie's coming out is it what we need? Probably not. But is it what we can all relate to? Sure, shit. Yeah, like it's gonna be real dark, which so, is how every day looks here. So, it, right now, comic books and comic book characters, America is not old enough to as a country to have like mythos, like the Greek gods and the you know the Roman gods. I feel like comic books kind of took that role of the mythology of America with these super powered beings that were like god level beings for ancient civilizations would have been like and they kind of created those mythos for them so that's kind of you know america's mythos um and i think they're some of the most intriguing characters i think you know much like you can relate superman's origins to the moses story where his parents kind of sent him off just like moses was sent down the river and he grew up um to lead you know his people and you can look at x-men for you know the civil rights um issues that they tried to correlate to and all these comics told deeper stories more than just children's stories so you know for anybody watching this who's kind of on the fence about comics or comic book movies i really you know i hope that this kind of helped you look at comics in a different way and see that there's tones behind the stories that you know these artists and these these writers they put a lot more into the stories than just bad guys and beating up injustice there was more right. tones to it um and i really hope that you know you enjoyed hearing about the history of the comics um if you did feel free to again like i said there's a lot of great documentaries on the one and only Stan Lee, and there's also a really good book called Slugfest if you guys want to check it out. It's amazing, and it kind of chronicles this a little bit better than I could have um, the short amount of time that we had. But I really hope you guys give comics another chance or give it a first chance even um, and really kind of support the medium because, like I said, it is kind of dying down comic books, but it's a really great medium. Awesome. Uh, so we want to hear what you guys think. Uh, send us a DM, send us a tweet, uh, send us an email, if that's what you prefer to communicate. Um, but let us know what are some of your favorite comic book characters. Um, or if you're not, simply not into comic books, and why. Um, I think that's interesting too. I, I, I kind of want to know why. Like if there's, yeah. like, I don't like to read or whatever, whatever it is. Um, but uh, thank you. I, I said at the beginning of the episode, I'll keep saying it. Uh, thank you guys so much for subscribing and uh, downloading all of our content every single week. Um, it makes putting on this, uh, putting on the show for you guys possible. Um, so we truly, truly appreciate it. All the links to all of our social media accounts will be in uh, the description box below this video. Um, and again, thank you so, so, so much uh, for continuously listening to us. And if you like this video and want to see more of our videos, make sure you hit the little subscribe button right there. Swing on over and hit that. Again, I'm never going to say smash it. I should have because of a Hulk, but I'm not going to say smash it. Um, but make sure you also listen to our audio versions, which are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, still not Pandora. No. <laughs> and most other places you're going to listen. Um, but that will do it for us here, folks, as we close up shop here in the Bat Cave. As always, he's been Anthony. I've been Carlson. And remember... Stay true believers. Excelsior. Until next time.